So in addition to the other two readings we've heard from the first and the last books of the Bible, this is a reading from the Hebrew Scripture, from the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's begin first with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, once more draw near to us. Surround us with your grace. Open our hearts to your wisdom. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Ecclesiastes 3 has these famous words. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen this business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. God has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, God has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So I know there is nothing better for them than to be happy and to enjoy themselves as long as they live. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so today is finally here. May 15th has been on my mind for months now. I've written and delivered about 1,000 sermons since coming to ELPC in 2006. But this one feels different because by definition it's a final sermon. It's made up of final words. So I looked up on the internet some examples of famous final words and actually only rarely are last words particularly memorable. Humphrey Bogart said, I should have never switched from scotch to martinis. Oscar Wilde was dying in a Paris hotel room and shortly before his death he evidently looked around the room and with his final breath he said, either that wallpaper goes or I go. <laughs> so I've known this day and I've known that this sermon were coming so for weeks now the sun has risen and the sun has set and May 15th drew ever closer. But there's comfort in knowing that that same sun will rise again tomorrow and set again in the evening as well, and that life goes on for all of us. And that's part of the reason why the verses from Ecclesiastes 3 are so often read at church services. They remind us of these comforting cycles of life. There's a season for everything under the sun, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to plant and a time to harvest, to pluck up what's been planted. Like breathing in and breathing out, life has symmetry to it, day to night, summer to winter. As it says in Fiddler on the Roof, one season following another, laden with happiness and tears. Everyone's life is marked by these patterns, these cycles of coming and going, of saying hello and saying goodbye. My life over the years included many of them, leaving home to go to college, 
going overseas for the first time to study piano, and then returning back to the States, going off to seminary on the East Coast, and then leaving the United States to serve my very first church in Zimbabwe, Africa, then returning back to the United States, accepting a call to a church in Wisconsin, meeting my wife Beth, starting a family, completing a PhD, and then the move here to Pittsburgh. All of them seasons to put down roots, but also seasons to pluck up and to start anew. And there have been many of those seasons here at this church over the years. Just going back 50 years, there were the seasons of Dr. Robshaw and Dr. Kettering. There were the seasons of Reverend Hewitt and Reverend Chestnut. There was a transition time with Rick Adi and Richard Saramani. And then there have been the more current seasons with, with Heather and Patrice and myself. Seasons of Tizay worship and LGBT inclusion and anti-racism initiatives and building renovations and much, much more. What's been true in my life and what's been true in this church's life, I'm sure is also true in your own lives. You've had seasons of coming and going, of endings and beginnings. Yet as true as that may be, it is not the full truth. Life is always more than just cycles of day and night, summer and winter. Life has a purpose. Life has a direction. And that's why the words of Ecclesiastes need to be paired with other words from Scripture, often words from Revelation, the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 21, it talks about this time of a new heaven and a new earth, not simply another cycle in the eternal cycles of the old heaven and earth, but literally a new one altogether. It's to be the home of God with us, a place without death, without mourning or crying or pain or tears. And then the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, goes further. And it insists that in that place and in that time, we won't need lights and lamps and the sun because God will be our light forever and ever. And as poetic as that language is, it points to a transformed reality, a different way of being beyond the seasons and the cycles of this life. But even that is not the whole story. Our life is not meant to be a holding pattern until we can finally step into the sweet by and by, finally move into some future reality of God's new heaven and earth. And that's why we not only need the last book of the Bible, but we also need the first book of the Bible the wisdom found in Genesis. In the beginning, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. And God said, let there be light. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And see, here's where the incredible wisdom of the Jewish faith is most readily evident. We've been taught in Western culture to think about the day as something that begins at sunrise and ends at sundown. That we're all called to get up in the morning while the birds are singing and go about our work while the sun is in the sky until it's too dark to see and then we go to bed. But see, that approach defines our day around what we can accomplish, what we can do, what we can produce, what we can make, what we can earn, what we can manipulate before the sun sets and nighttime falls. But the Jewish wisdom in Genesis says there was evening and there was morning the first day. When the sun goes down, that's when the day begins. It's that time precisely <clears throat> where you can't do any work. It's that time when life isn't shaped by us, by our doing and producing and making and earning. It's in that moment when the day begins because then we're reminded that God is in charge. 
to whom darkness is as light, and that we walk by faith, not by sight. It's at that moment when we can no longer see that God in effect says to us, then look to me and trust that I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And whatever season is before you, I'm already there. So let's walk into this evening and then later the new morning together. One of the most influential seasons in my life happened when I was about 19 years old. I received a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship that allowed me to study piano at the Music Conservatory in Salzburg, Austria. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't note that this opportunity arose because of church friends who were members in that local Rotary Club back in Paola, Kansas, who encouraged me to apply for this scholarship and open the door for me. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also humbly name that such opportunities came my way as part of a larger unjust societal pattern of white privilege and opportunities that are so often biased towards Caucasians. But that year in Austria was literally life-changing. I lived in a student, student dormitory with people from all over the world, from Australia and Malaysia and Costa Rica and Israel, and all of us were struggling to understand the Austrian dialect of the German language. All of us were struggling to adapt in this foreign culture, but we were united as pianists and singers and instrumentalists by the love of our musical art in this strange setting. But what I remember is that at the end of that year together, one by one, my friends left. They returned home. I remember standing at the dormitory door and waving goodbye to Vasui, the Malaysian violinist, and to Laura, the Costa Rican oboist, and to Kevin, the irascible Canadian bassoonist. I wasn't sure if I would ever literally see them again, and as truth has been told, I haven't. But we'd load their bags in the cab, and we'd hug one last time, and we waved as they drove away, and then at some point they'd be out of sight. And I'd turn, and I'd go back into the dormitory, knowing that in a short time I also would be the one getting into that cab and driving away. Now I'm sure you've all had similar experiences, times when You've said goodbye to Cam, to, to said goodbye to friends after a summer camp that was particularly memorable. Or when you've watched as family members have shut the moving van and taken off for a new destination. Or when you stepped out of your office for the last time carrying some box of books, leaving it behind you. But what I want to emphasize is that you are not most alive when you notice that life has these seasons of coming and going. And nor are you most alive when you simply endure those seasons, waiting with your focus on a future day and a future revelation of a long-awaited heaven and earth. Now I think you are most alive when you stand on the curb, waving goodbye to someone or something, and then when you take a breath and you turn and by faith you step towards whatever is next in your life. It's in that moment that you are answering the question posed by the poet Mary Oliver, what then will you do with your one wild and precious life? It's at that moment when you are potentially most faithful, most honest, and acting most worthily when, if the sun is setting, you recognize that whatever comes next, you cannot do alone. And so you give yourself over to God, who is the Lord of the night and of the day, the Lord of every season of life. Because yes, for everything there is a season, but by God's grace and by your free will, you shape that season and decide whether it will be for love or for hate, for war or for peace, for building up 
or for tearing down. I do want to say thank you for the love and support that you've shown me and my family over these past 16 years. And I remain incredibly grateful for this congregation and for the staff here at ELPC, for the ways that together we have walked by faith and tried new things and responded to challenges both inside these walls and outside in the community, how we've sought to be people of justice and compassion and radical hospitality. When I think about the sermons that you've heard over the many years, the messages from the three pastors here, they've all been different yet complementary. Heather and Patrice have always made sure you know that God is love and justice must roll down like mighty waters. And if I consider my own sermons, I think the message has simply been, be not afraid. God is with us. And God sends us out into every season to join with Christ in healing the world. Sunday after Sunday, I've had the privilege to stand here and stare at the Penn Avenue doors. Season after season, we've stood at the end of worship for benedictions. But then in that moment, every one of you has taken a breath and then taken a step by faith into a future held by God, shaped by the good news of Christ's resurrection, and enlivened by the creative breath of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what's special about Ecclesiastes 3. Normally when it's read, the minister stops at verse 8, but it's after those verses something profound is said, where it's written, God has made everything suitable for its time and put a sense of the past and the future in our minds. You have been made not to be captive to the changing seasons of life. You have been given the ability to both remember the past and to imagine the future, to learn, to dream, to love, to trust, to dare to fix what is broken and to cast away that which is unworthy and to plant seeds of resurrection hope wherever you go. So I can't really offer you any final words because even though we're going to be in different cities, our conversation doesn't stop today. It will continue. It will be a chorus of faith that's lived out here in Pittsburgh and in Maryland. A chorus that will be joined together by God's own Holy Spirit, active in this place and far beyond its walls. So all I can say is I look forward to worshiping with you in the seasons to come. Amen.